All rise, the score is now in session. The Honorable Judge Frederick G. Evans presides. Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning, Mr. Pryor. Good morning, Judge. Good morning, Mr. Daybell. Good morning, Mr. Wood. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Rammel. Good morning, Judge. We're going to go on the record here in Fremont County. It is August the 3rd, 2020. This is case number CR 2220-755. My name is Judge Eddins. This is the case of State of Idaho versus Chad Guy Daybell. This is the date and time set for a preliminary hearing. Uh, before we get started here today, uh, the court notes that there have been various precautions that have been taken in order to ensure the safety of COVID-19 issues. Some of those precautions are being six feet away from each other. The court has installed plexiglass up here at the bench. The court notes that uh, Mr. Wood, Mr. Pryor, and Mr. Daybell are not wearing masks. Uh, Mr. Wood, do you want to comment on that issue? Hi, Your Honor, I can certainly put on the mask. I, uh, it is a little difficult to question and ask, uh, speak with them on, but uh, we'll certainly follow the court's directive. Mr. Pryor? Judge, my preference is, is that I be uh, afforded an opportunity to communicate with Mr. Uh, Daybell during these proceedings. Uh, Mr. Wood and I have a significant amount of space between us. I would, I would do whatever the court directs me to do, but at this point my preference would be to be able to not only question the witnesses, but in addition be able to speak without uh, any impediment uh, uh, with Mr. Uh, Daybell. If the court directs us otherwise, I will obviously do exactly what the court tells us to do. Mr. Pryor, do you feel that wearing a mask is going to impede your ability to communicate effectively with your client? I believe that if there are questions during the proceedings, Judge, I'm going to have to remove the mask. He'll have to remove the mask and we'll have to have a discussion. Um, I, I think that at this point there could be a, some, some difficulties if we have to communicate through those masks and I'd rather not do that. It's a personal choice, but I still think it would have an impact on my ability to not only question the witnesses, but to effectively talk with my client during these proceedings. So again, it would be my preference if the, honor, if the judge would uh, honor that request. Mr. Wood, do you feel not wearing a, or wearing a mask is going to impede your ability to effectively communicate with witnesses and effectively question those witnesses? It will certainly make it more difficult, Your Honor. All right, the court's going to proceed as follows. I will allow uh, the parties that are not wearing masks currently to continue not to, wearing, to wear masks. However, uh, I will require that the six feet uh, requirement be put into place. Uh, I want everyone to spread away from each other. I recognize Mr. Pryor, you're gonna have to communicate with your client and that's going to be closer than six feet. You recognize that there may be a risk there, but uh, that's a risk you're willing to take as well as Mr. Daybell, is that correct? It is, Judge. All right, uh, we'll proceed uh, with that then. We'll proceed with the preliminary hearing. Is this matter going to be heard today, Mr. Wood? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Pryor? Yes, it is, Judge. Thank you. Are there any preliminary motions that need to be dealt with before we start the hearing? No, not from the state. Judge, uh, I think we may want to approach briefly on an issue, um, if, if we may. Okay. Would you like to have a, uh, a meeting in chambers briefly? No, just if, we, if Mr. Wood and I could approach the court, uh, it would be a very brief uh, inquiry, and, and uh, uh, Mr. Wood and I have... Uh, unfortunately been talking all weekend obviously about this and in preparation for this and there is one issue that we can briefly take up that'll take that's not a significant consequence but will hopefully and effectively uh, uh, advance the the speed of this preliminary hearing i would like to take the issue up in chambers so there's no issues with uh, recordings okay. and everything else we'll right. uh, we'll take a brief recess back in chambers we'll reconvene here in just a moment We're going to go back on the record in CR 2220-755, State of Idaho versus Chad Guy Daybell. The court took a brief uh, recess so I could have a sidebar with counsel from the defense and the state. We'll proceed forward. Mr. Wood, does the state wish to make an opening argument here today? No, Your Honor. The state will just proceed. Mr. Pryor, does the defense wish to make any opening arguments? Not at this time, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Mr. Wood, you may call your first witness. Thank you. The state calls uh, Ray Hermosillo. Mr. Hermosillo. 
If you'll please come forward, stand here in front of the witness stand. Raise your right arm and face the clerk. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give in this cause, not pending, shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help them? Do you? Mr. Hermosillo, you can be seated here at the witness stand. Once you uh, enter that witness stand, because it is surrounded by plexiglass, I'll allow you to remove your mask. If you'll uh, get fairly close to that microphone so that we can make a record of you. Mr. Hermosillo, we are making a court record as well. So if you'll make sure to listen to the full question before you begin answering, it will ensure that no two people are talking over each other uh, on the record. Mr. Hermosillo, if you'll give your full name as well as your occupation, we'll get started. Ray Dennis Hermosillo. I'm a detective with the Rexburg Police Department. Thank you. Mr. Wood, you may inquire when you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Before I do ask Mr. or Detective Hermosillo any questions, I have several uh, self-authenticating documents and documents that uh, should come into the court under Rule 201. And I uh, will provide those to the court. Uh, States Exhibit 1. I'm okay. assuming I hand this to the, the bailiff. Uh, Mr. Pryor, have you seen a, a copy of States Exhibit 1? I have gotten all of the exhibits at this point, but in terms of the numeric, numeric order that they're put in, I have seen that, Judge, and there's no objection to that. All right. Exhibit 1 will be admitted. Mr. Wood, would you like that to be handed to the witness? Yes. Thank you. And then, Your Honor, I have uh, several more states. Exhibit 2. Okay. Exhibit 2 will be handed to the bailiff. Ms. Bailiff, if you'll please show that to Mr. Pryor. Mr. Pryor, any objection to the self-authentication of Exhibit 2 being admitted? No objection, Your Honor. Exhibit 2 will be admitted. Uh, states Exhibit 3. Ms. Bailiff, if you'll do the same with Exhibit 3. Mr. Pryor, any objection to Exhibit 3? No objection, Your Honor. Exhibit 3 will be admitted. States, um, excuse me, States Exhibit 4. Any objection to Exhibit 4, Mr. Pryor? No objection, Judge. Exhibit 4 will be admitted. And States Exhibit 5. No objection, Judge. Exhibit 5 will be admitted. Your Honor, States Exhibit 1 through 5 are all self-authenticating documents. I have two documents I will ask the court to take judicial notice of. Uh, the first is an order on a petition under the Child Protective Act in Madison County case CV 33-20-45 uh, uh, in the interest of Tylee Ashlyn Ryland and Joshua Jackson Vallow. Uh, this order was signed by yourself in that case. Mr. Pryor, any objection to the court taking judicial notice of that document? Judge, if I could have just one moment, may I please? No problem. Mr. Wood, you're not asking for that uh, document to be marked? Uh, we will ask for it to be marked and entered as an exhibit as well. Okay, exhibit six. Is that correct? Yes. No objection. Mm -hmm. Exhibit 6 will be admitted. And then... Uh, would you like me to uh, just take that into the clerk's possession at this point, Mr. Wood? Yes, that would be fine. The court will do so. And one more document the state would ask the court to take judicial notice of and that we'd ask to be entered in State's Exhibit 7. <clears throat> An order in that same child protection case uh, deeming that Lori Vallow was served on January 25th and that any uh, uh, errors in that service were cured. Okay. Mr. Pryor, any objection to Exhibit 7? No objection, Judge. Exhibit 7 will be admitted. The court will take judicial notice of said exhibit. Mr. Wood, any other? No, if I may inquire of the the witness now. You may inquire when you're ready. Thank you. Mr. Hermosillo, will you state your name and spell it for the court? Ray Dennis Hermosillo. 
R-A-Y-D-E-N-N-I-S-H-E-R-M-O-S-I-L-L-O. Thank you. What is your current occupation? I'm a detective with the Rexburg City Police Department. How long have you been a detective? Uh, over a year. Okay. How long have you been with the Rexburg Police Department? 19 years. Are you post certified? I am. Okay. Detective, have you ever had the opportunity to meet the defendant, Chad Daybell? Yes. Is he, in the, is he here in the court today? He is. Uh, can you point him out and describe what he's wearing? Sitting at a defense table in a white shirt, blue tie. Thank you. Detective, how did you become involved in the, investiga the investigation regarding J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan? In early November, I was contacted by Gilbert Police Department. Uh, I was asked to seize a Jeep that was in Lori Vallow's possession. Um, along with that, I was asked to perform intermittent surveillance. Uh, uh, and did you, did you do that for the Gilbert Police Department? I did. Okay. Uh, did, they, did they ever ask you to do anything else? Yes. What, what was that? I was asked to do a welfare check on November 25th, okay. 2019. Oh, 2019? Yes, sir. Who were you asked to do a welfare check on? A seven-year-old boy by the name of Joshua Jackson Vallow, who also went by JJ. Okay, and is it all right with you if I just refer to that child as JJ from here on out? Yes. Okay. Detective, have you ever met JJ Vallow? No. Have you ever met Tylee Ryan? No. Okay. Uh, through your investigation, have you learned what J.J. Vallow and Tyler Ryan looked like? I have. Okay. Uh, how have you done that? I've seen hundreds of videos and photographs of Tyler and J.J. both. Okay. Uh, Detective, I'd like to ask, I'm going to ask you to look at State's Exhibit 1. Before we uh, get any further into this, let me just remind the media that pursuant to Idaho Court Administrative Rule 32, the court is prohibiting the photography or the filming of any exhibits uh, until further order of the court. That would include, but not be limited to, any documents that are exhibits, any pictures that are exhibits, and any film that are exhibits that are going to be played potentially today. I will allow the cameras to remain running so that the audio can be recorded, but uh, any photography or filming of any of those exhibits is prohibited also any filming or recording of any of the, the table of the defense, uh, any notes or anything else is prohibited as well as the state. So with that, Mr. Wood, you may proceed. Thank you. Uh, Detective, do you have State's Exhibit 1? I do. What is that document? This is a birth certificate for Kane and Trahan. For who? Kane and Trahan. Okay. And what is Kane and Trahan's birth date? May 25th, 2012. Okay. And who are Kane and Trahan's parents listed as? Dennis Trahan and Mandy Ledger. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Detective, can you look at State's Exhibit 2? What is that document? An adoption decree. Okay. Uh, who is listed uh, on that adoption decree? Who is the, the child listed on that adoption decree? Cain uh, and Trahan. Cain and Trahan. Uh, who are the adoptive parents of Cain and Trahan? Mr. Wood, I, I'm having a hard time hearing. Are you saying Cayman? Canaan. Canaan. Can you have the, uh, the witness spell that name, please? C-A-N-A-A-N. -A -A and the last name? T-R-A-H-A-N. Thank you. Thank you. Who are the adoptive parents of Kane and Trahan? Leland Charles Anthony Vallow and Lori Noreen Cox Vallow. Okay. And does that document contain a name change for Kane and Trahan? It does. What is his name changed to? Joshua Jackson Vallow. Okay. The detective, will you look at States Exhibit 3? What is that document? A birth certificate. Uh, who is it a birth certificate for? Joshua Jackson Vallow. Okay, and what is the birth date listed on that? May 25th, 2012. Thank you. 
will you look at States Exhibit 4? What is that document? A birth certificate. Uh, who is it a birth certificate for? Tylee Ashlyn Ryan. What is her birth date listed? 9-24-2002. And who are the, the parents listed on that? Joseph Anthony Ryan Jr. and Lori Noreen Cox. Okay. And Detective, will you look at State's Exhibit 5? What is that? A marriage certificate. Uh, who is it a marriage certificate for? Chad Guy Daybell and Lori Marine Ryan Vallow. Okay, and what is the date of marriage? November 5th, 2019. And where was that certificate, uh, that certificate of marriage issued? In Hawaii, on the island of Kauai. Okay, thank you. Uh, Detective, you testified earlier you were asked to do a welfare check, correct? Correct. Um, what did you do in response to that welfare check? On November 26th, 2019, myself and Detective Hope went to 565 Pioneer Road, which was Lori Vallow's residence. Um, we ended up making contact with the defendant, Mr. Daybell, and Alex Cox. Okay, I'm going to stop you there. Who was Alex Cox? Alex Cox is Lori's brother. Okay. Um, so you made contact with them. What happened? I made contact with Alex and asked Alex if Lori was home. How did he respond? Judge, I'm going to object here, sir. Mr. Wood. Uh, Your Honor, this is a statement of a co-conspirator coming in. He is an unavailable witness because he's no longer living, but it's still a statement of a co-conspirator, and I think it comes in. Mr. Pryor, I'll let you respond to that. Judge, I'd like to see the court documents that list Mr. Alex Cox as a co-conspirator. I don't believe those uh, documents are presently uh, in existence at this point, so I've, I have nothing uh, that supports that other than Mr. Wood's statement. Mr. Wood. Your Honor, the complaint alleges uh, Mr. Daybell, Mrs. Vallow, conspirators known and known, and the probable cause affidavit clearly lists Alex Cox as a co-conspirator. Mr. Pryor, it appears that Mr. Wood is uh, explaining that because it is information uh, communicated between co-conspirators named in a criminal complaint, it falls under uh, the rule of non-hearsay under the Idaho criminal rules, do you wish, or excuse me, the Idaho rules of evidence, do you wish to respond to that? Judge, the uh, complaint also lists known and unknown. So at this point, uh, if we go by Mr. Wood's uh, uh, analysis, uh, anybody could be listed or mentioned as a co-conspirator and all sorts of information can come in. So at this point, I stand by my initial uh, response, which is, uh, at least from my reading of the pleadings and the current criminal charges that are filed, there are two people that are alleged in this thing, and, and at that point, that's what I believe the proper application of the rule is. Okay. All right, the court is going to overrule the objection. Uh, the court finds that uh, Alex Cox is named in the criminal complaint. At this juncture, we're at a preliminary hearing stage where probable cause is the standard. Mr. Pryor, if there are other uh, co-conspirators that are named or that are brought up here today, uh, you may renew your objection or you may renew your objection in a further time if you feel that uh, the allegation has not been presented sufficiently enough to show that Mr. Cox is a co-conspirator, but I am going to allow it. Um, under 801, uh, the exception that allows for uh, co-conspirator communication to be admitted. So with that, Mr. Wood, you may continue to inquire. Thank you. Detective, can you answer that question? Can you ask it one more time, please? Yes. Uh, so, well, you had testified you made contact with Mr. Daybell and Mr. Cox. What did you ask Mr. Cox? I asked Mr. Cox if Lori Vallow was home. How did he respond? He stated she was not home. Okay. Uh, what happened after that? I asked Alex if JJ was home. Uh, I informed Mr. Cox why I was there is to do a welfare check on JJ. Uh, so I asked him if he was there. How did he respond? Initially, he didn't respond. Uh, he just looked at the defendant, Daybell, and didn't answer my question initially. 
Okay. And then what happened? I asked him again, and he stated that Joshua was with his grandma Kay in Louisiana. Okay. How did you respond to that? I told Mr. Cox that was unlikely because uh, Kay was the one who originally called in the welfare check. All right. Uh, what happened after that? I asked Mr. Cox uh, how I can get a hold of Lori and asked him for her phone number. How did he respond? Uh, he stated he didn't have it. Okay. Uh, what did that make you think when he told you he didn't have his phone number? Judge, I'm going to object. Reason? Judge, this witness can offer his uh, uh, recitation of the facts, but if we're going to start getting into the issue of whether or not he gets to present his, his impression in terms of what a third party had told him, I think is inappropriate. Mr. Wood, can you repeat the question for the court? Uh, the question was what Mr. What Detective Hermosillo thought of Mr. Cox's response that he did not have Lori Ballow's phone number. Mr. Wood, do you want to respond to the objection made by Mr. Pryor? Uh, Your Honor, I'm not aware of any rule that doesn't allow the detective to uh, describe his, his thoughts on an investigation. I'm going to overrule the objection. Uh, Mr. Hermosillo, you can uh, give your thoughts as to what you were feeling at that time. Mr. Pryor, if that goes beyond thoughts, you're welcome to uh, re-up your objection and I'll re-take it up to... Thank you, uh, Judge. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Wood. Can you answer the question? I thought it was suspicious because I knew that they had been close based on uh, my initial investigation. Okay. Uh, what happened what happened after that detective I asked Mr. Cox where I could find Lori so I can make contact with her uh, and he stated that she was in apartment 107 okay um, once you learned that information what did you do myself and detective Dave Hope then went to 107 to attempt to make contact with Lori uh, uh, what happened there Detective Dave Hope went to knock on the front door. Um, as he was knocking on the front door, I saw the defendant, Daybell, driving towards me in his black Equinox. Okay, and what did you do? I stopped Mr. Daybell to further speak with him. Yeah. Uh, did you ask him any questions? I did. What did you ask him? I asked Mr. Daybell when's the last time he saw JJ, and he stated that he saw JJ in apartment 107 in October. Okay. Now, apartment 107, do you know who, you've stated this was on 565 Pioneer Road, do you know who apartment 107 belonged to or who, it lived, who, or who lived in that apartment? Not at that time. Okay. Uh, what happened after, after he gave you that answer? I asked Mr. Daybell for Lori Vallow's phone number and he stated he didn't have it. Okay. Uh, what did you think about it? What did you think of when he told you he didn't have her number? I again found it suspicious because I knew that they were married two weeks prior to my contact with Mr. Daybill. Okay, and, and again, just for clarification, what was the date we're talking about now? What was that date? November 26, 2019. Okay. Uh, did you ask Mr. Daybell any other questions? I did. I asked Mr. Daybell how he knew Lori Vallow, and he stated that he had only met her a couple times through Alex Cox. Okay. What happened after that? Mm -hmm. Detective Hope had come back to where we were speaking. Um, I again asked Mr. Daybell if he had Lori's phone number, and at that point he gave me Lori Bellow's phone number. Okay. Did you ask him why he hadn't given you that number? I did. And what was his response? He stated that he felt like I was accusing him of something. Okay. Uh, in your interaction with him, had you accused him of anything? No. Okay. What did you do in your investigation after that? I called, I broke contact with Mr. Daybell and called Lieutenant Ron Ball uh, to respond to my location. Based on Mr. Daybell's actions, uh, Mr. Cox's actions, what I was told about them hardly knowing each other. I felt there was something more going on with the whereabouts of JJ, so I wanted more officers over there so we could figure out what was going on. Okay, uh, and then what happened after that? 
Lieutenant Ron Ball, Detective Dave Stubbs, uh, and Officer Kellen Wett responded over to 565 Pioneer. Okay. Uh, and then what happened? Myself and Lieutenant Ron Ball attempted to make contact with Lori in apartment 175 and were unable to make contact with anybody in apartment 175. Okay. Uh, what did you do after that? We went to apartment 174, which was uh, Melanie Boudreaux's apartment. I'm going to stop right there. Uh, who is Melanie Boudreaux? It's Lori's niece. Okay. Uh, and, and then what happened? We were unable to make contact with anybody there as well. Okay. So what did you do after that? I was instructed by Lieutenant Ron Ball to go to the prosecutor's office and obtain a search warrant. Is that what you did? I went to the prosecutor's office, yes. Did you obtain a search warrant that day? No, I did not. Okay. Um, did you have any contact with uh, Lori Vallow that day? I did not have any contact with Lori, no. Okay. Uh, were you still with Detective Hope? I was. Uh, did he, do you know if he had contact with Lori Vallow that day? He did. Okay. Uh, do you know... Judge, could I have some foundation as to... I, uh, I can lay that. All right. You were with Detective Hope that day? Yes. Uh, do you know if he ever attempted to call Lori Vallow with the number you were given? He did. He attempted to call Lori Vallow on the way to the prosecutor's office. Okay. And uh, did he ever uh, get in touch with her? Did he call, did he, did she ever answer the phone when he called? No, he was able to leave a message on her voicemail. Okay. And were you with him when he did that? Uh, I was not with him when he did that. Judge, I'm okay. approved to strike. Okay. Reason? Well, Judge, he has no basis other than um, what he was told, obviously, if he wasn't present during that conversation. I'm not sure how he can um, admit that conversation since he wasn't present for that, and the only way he would know that is if either Lieutenant Ball or someone else told him that that took place. It's hearsay at this point, and it's not admissible. Your Honor, we'll just move on. It's fine. All right. That would be I, stricken. I, just, I would do ask that it be stricken from the record, though. The, uh, that conversation will be stricken from the record. Just so I'm clear, Mr. Pryor, the, the conversation between uh, Mr. Ball and... Your Honor, I believe it was Detective Hope that Detective I, Stubbs I listed. I apologize. I said Lieutenant Ball. Uh, Lieutenant Ball? Detective Hope. Detective Ball. I apologize. I, okay. I meant uh, Officer Hope. I apologize. That conversation will be stricken. Okay. Uh, Detective, during your investigation that day, were you able to locate J.J. Vallow? No. Okay. Did you... Uh, have you spoken with Detective Ball and Detective Stubbs about their investigation that day? I have. Do you know if parts of their investigation were on body cam? It was. Judge, I'm going to object again, foundation. Mr. Wood? Mr. Pryor, the, the question was if Mr. or Officer Hermosillo knew if it was on body cam. So I, I, I'm going to overrule that objection. That's just a question for Mr. Hermosillo. Obviously, what's, what's in the body cam is probably a different story. You may proceed. Thank you. Mr. Hermosillo, you may, you may answer that question. It was on body cam. Okay. Have you had an opportunity to watch that body cam? Yes. Okay. Uh, I asked you earlier if you were able Judge, to... could we approach, please? You may. Would you like to do that back in chambers? No, no. Right. I'll instruct the media to make sure that uh, recording is not taking place here. We'll go back on the record. The court took a brief sidebar to discuss an evidentiary issue Mr. Wood, you may ask that question again, please. Uh, Detective Hermosillo, have you watched the body cam video of Detective Stubbs? Yes. Okay. Did you obtain a search warrant on November 26th? On November 26th? Yes. No. Okay. I'm going to call your attention to November 27th, 2019. Um, what did you do in furtherance of your investigation uh, on November 27th? We were able to obtain a search warrant for apartments 175, 174, and 107 at okay. 565 Pioneer. Um, and did you, what was the purpose of searching those apartments? 
to locate JJ. Okay. At this time, were you searching for Tylee Ryan? No. Were you aware of Tylee Ryan at this time? No. Okay. Um, so where did you search? All three apartments. Okay. And, and just for clarity of the record, those three apartments are 175, 174, and 107 on 565 Pioneer Road? That's correct. Thank you. Uh, were you able to locate JJ in any of those apartments? No, we were not. Okay. Uh, did you find, what evidence, if any, did you find to suggest he had been living there in there, any of those apartments? In 175, there was a half empty prescription bottle of Respirdone and also a suitcase that had JJ's name on it. Okay, and that prescription bottle, did that have JJ's name on it? It did. Okay. Was there anything else of interest to you in searching those apartments? Yes. What was that? The apartments appeared to be lived in. There was food in the refrigerator, food in the pantry, uh, furniture. The only thing that was off in 175 was it appeared that there was no clothes. Everything had been taken off the hangers and there was no clothes in the dresser drawers. Okay. Um, did all three apartments appear to be lived in at the moment? Uh, no. Oh. Can you elaborate on that? 107 was completely vacant. Okay. Um, did you obtain another search warrant that day? We did. Uh, what caused you to obtain another search warrant? During the initial search of 175 in the master bedroom, a rental agreement was located uh, for a self-storage unit on Airport Road. All right. Uh, do you know the name of that storage unit? Self-storage. Self-storage. Oh, okay. I apologize. I misheard you. Uh, do you know the number of the storage unit? I believe it was C-52. Okay. And did you uh, execute that search warrant? We did. What did you find? There were some winter clothing uh, in a couple of boxes, a couple of children's bikes, and in the winter clothing there was a couple personalized blankets uh, that had the, the pictures, look like family pictures that were sewn onto the blankets. Okay. Detective, what city are those apartments located in? I'm sorry? What city were those apartments located in? Rexburg. Okay. Uh, and what county is Rexburg in? Madison County. Thank you. Detective, uh, at the end of November 27th, had you located J.J. Vallow? No, we had not. Okay. What was the next step in your investigation? Well, our next step was we were just trying to locate J.J. Uh, we had obtained search warrants for cell phone data, spoke to numerous uh, friends of the family. Judge, could I get some foundation, please? That's a, that's a very broad statement regarding phone records and, and, and discussing witnesses with family. So you're making an objection on foundational purposes, is that correct? It is, Judge. Thank you. All right. Mr. Wood? I'll lay some more foundation, Your Honor. Um, as part of your investigation, did you try to locate uh, individuals who may have known uh, Chad Daybell or Lori Vallow? Yes, we did. Okay. Uh, who were some of those individuals? Family and friends. Okay. Uh, do you know any of their names? Uh, Melanie Boudreaux, Ian Pulowski, uh, Gilbert Police had contacted family members in Arizona. Okay. All right. Uh, did you engage uh, the help of any other law enforcement agencies? We did. We asked for assistance from the FBI. Okay. While you were searching for J.J. Vallow, uh, at any time did Lori Vallow or Chad Daybell, to your knowledge, ever call the Rexburg Police to report missing children? No. In fact, we attempted several times to get a hold of Lori and her cell phone were shut off. Uh, we attempted to get a hold of Chad and never return, gotten any return phone calls. And in fact, they retained an attorney and refused to answer any questions. Uh, detective, uh, 
during your search for JJ, did that investigation ever grow to include Tyree Ryan? It did. Why was that? In speaking with family members, uh, we were also told that nobody Judge, had... I'm going to object at this point. What grounds? Well, it's hearsay. If he's going to start, and the court's nodding its head, obviously, if he's going to start reciting what other people have told him, uh, uh, other than what is permissible under the rules, that's, that's hearsay, Judge. It's not admissible. Mr. Wood, do you wish to respond to that objection? Yes, Your, Your Honor, I think it comes in on, for the effect of, on the listener to explain what the investigator did. Can you give me the specific exception under Rule 801? Yes. Are you looking at 803, Mr. Wood? Yes, Your Honor. And will you give me which subsection you're looking at? Your Honor, I think it comes in under 803.1, the present sense impression explains the, uh, what Detective Hermosillo learned and why he did what he did based on that. Mr. Pryor? Judge, in response, that's not a present sense impression. What it is is it's, it's, there's an investigation that's going on and what Mr. Wood is attempting to do is to get statements from witnesses who are not here today. Uh, it's clearly hearsay, Judge. His initial response, obviously, in terms of uh, why it comes in, was not appropriate. And this one's just as no, is, 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 uh, not proper uh, in terms of a present sense impression. There Not only hasn't been proper foundation to suggest there's a present sense impression, which uh, he needs to first establish that. Secondly, uh, if, if this witness would like to talk about actions that he took, I'm not going to tell Mr. Wood how to get him any evidence in, but if he would like to uh, uh, talk about any actions this officer took as a result of talking with other people, he can do that. But clearly, the statements of those other people does not come in. It's hearsay. It's not admissible under any of the exceptions. Mr. Wood, any other response? Yes, Your Honor. Again, it's not coming in for the truth of the matter. It's coming in to establish uh, why Mr. Hermosillo or Detective Hermosillo and his team did what they did. And Judge, that's not necessary for you to bring in the statements then. All you have to do is say, officer, and I'm not again telling Mr. Wood how to try his case, but quite honestly, Judge, if he suggests to this officer, officer, did you take any action based on what information you received from family members, we can move forward with this thing. But again, I stand by my initial objection. It is not permissible or appropriate for him to get in information from those other family members. There is another manner in which he can proceed if he wants to proceed that way. But, but getting those statements in is clearly inadmissible. Mr. Wood, I'm going to sustain the objection as it pertains to uh, specifics to what the family members stated. Uh, those are uh, hearsay. If there are specific statements that you're, you're looking to get in that are not truth of the matter asserted, uh, I'll let you continue and you can try to see what, what can happen, but if you're looking for specific instances or specific statements that have been made by the family members pertaining to the investigation, uh, I'm going to sustain the objection as hearsay. That's fine, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, Detective, did you take any steps to learn if Lori Vallow had any other children? We did. Okay, what steps were those? We spoke with family members we spoke with her son Colby Ryan okay and did you in your investigation uh, did that investigation grow from searching just for JJ to searching for JJ and Tyler Ryan yes it did thank you your honor I'd like to hand the exhibit or the witness exhibit states exhibit eight exhibit eight madam bailiff if you'll please show exhibit eight to mr Pryor. Thank you. Thank mr Pryor. judge there's no objection exhibit eight will be handed to the witness mr Pryor. just so i'm clear there's no objection to exhibit eight being admitted is that correct that's correct, Your Honor. Exhibit 8 will be admitted. 
Your Honor, I'd also ask that the witness be handed State's Exhibit 9. Any objection to that admission? No, Judge. Exhibit 9 will be admitted. Detective Hermosillo, can you look at State's Exhibit 8? Are you familiar with that, uh, with that exhibit? Yes. And what is it? It's a photograph of J.J., Tylee Ryan, and Alex Cox. Okay. Do you know where that photograph came from? I do. Where? It was obtained through a search warrant from Chandler Police Department from one of Lori Vallow's iCloud accounts. Okay. And have you had the opportunity to review the pictures on that iCloud account? Yes, I have. And so you recognize that picture? Yes. Uh, can you tell the court uh, what is in that picture? Uh, it appears they're in West Yellowstone, Yellowstone National Park. Okay. Um, and who all is in that picture? J.J., Tylee, and Alex Cox. Okay. Do you know what date that picture was taken? September 8th. Okay. 2019. Pardon? September 8th, 2019. Thank you. Can you look at Stakes Exhibit 9? Do you recognize that picture? I do. And have you seen it before? Yes, I have. Uh, do you know where that picture came from? Yes. Uh, can you tell the court? It was also obtained through a search warrant from Chandler Police Department from Lori's iCloud account. Okay. Uh, do you know what date that picture was taken? Uh, September 22nd, 2019. Okay, and who is in that picture? It's JJ sitting on a couch. Okay. Uh, Detective, as part of your investigation, uh, did you attempt to uh, locate the, or let me rephrase that. As part of your investigation, uh, did you look for proof of life of JJ and Tylee? We did. And, and what, uh, for the purposes of your investigation, would suffice for proof of life? We had set up a hotline through NICMIC, which is National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Uh, we also had a hotline set up through the FBI, and we would receive hundreds of tips on uh, possible sightings of JJ and Tylee. Okay. And would you follow up on those uh, tips and sightings as part of your investigation? We would. And is it fair to say that a photograph uh, of the child that you could recognize as a child could be considered proof of life? Yes. Okay. Uh, Detective, have you found any photographs of Tylee Ryan after September 8, 2019? That no. you can That you can positively identify as being taken after September 8, 2019? No, we have not. Okay. Uh, in your investigation, have you found any photographs after September 22nd, 2019 of JJ that can be positively identified as JJ? No, we have not. Okay. Detective, have you been able to verify through any tip or lead any other verifiable sighting of Tylee Ryan after September 8th, 2019? No. And have you been able to verify through your investigation uh, or find, I should say, through your investigation, any other verifiable sighting of J.J. Vallow after September 22nd? No. Okay. Uh, Detective, are you aware if a Child Protection Act was filed for J.J. Vallow and, and Tyler Ryan in Madison County, Idaho? Yes, I am. Were you involved in that? I was. How? I was the affiant. Okay. Uh, do you remember when that was filed? Uh, I believe it was January 16th, 2020. Okay. And are you familiar with the initial order in that action? Yes. Uh, did that order, let me ask this, did that order pertain to Mr. Daybell? No, it did not. Okay. Who did it pertain to? Lori Vallow. Uh, did that order um, instruct Lori Vallow to, to do anything? It instructed her to bring her minor children to the Rexburg Police Department 
or the dis the Department of Health and Welfare within five days of being served. Okay. And are you aware if Lori Vallow was ever served with that? She was. Okay. Do you remember what date she was served with that? Uh, January 25th, 2020. Okay. Uh, after that was filed, were you ever able to locate Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow? Yes. How did you do that? Through tips and obtaining search warrants for cell phone data. Okay. Uh, where did you believe they were located? In Hawaii on the island of Kauai. Okay. And did you ever have an opportunity to go there? I did. Okay. Uh, what did you do while you were there? Judge, could I have some foundation, please? Are you, can you give some specifics as far as date, time, place? Mr. Wood? When he left, when he came back? You bet. Uh, do you remember when you went to Hawaii? January 24th, 2020. Okay, do you remember when you returned from Hawaii? I, I don't remember the date. Okay. Uh, what island of Hawaii were you on? Or did you travel to? Kauai. Okay. Oh, and again, what was the purpose of you traveling to the island of Kauai? To assist the Kauai Police Department with serving Lori Vallow that uh, order, court order. Okay, and when you say the order, you're referring to that child protection order we just discussed? Yes. Okay. Uh, did you do anything else while you were there? Uh, we also assisted with surveillance. Okay. While you were there, did you ever see J.J. Vallow or Tyler Ryan? No, I did not. Okay. Uh, did you do anything else in furtherance of your investigation while you were there? Yes, I did. What was that? I observed Kauai Police Department execute a search warrant on the defendant Daybell's vehicle and also their residence in Princeville. Okay. Um, did you actually do the search or did you just observe Kauai Police Department do that? No, I just observed. Okay. Um, when you observed them, did you say you observed them search a vehicle? Yes. Do you know what kind of vehicle it was? Uh, it was a, an SUV. Okay. Detective Hermosillo, I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing you. If you don't mind speaking up just a little bit. Okay. I'll scoot closer. Is that better? Yeah, and if you point that microphone up, but aim it at your chin, it'll make a better record. There you go. All right. Um, that vehicle, had you observed Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow in that vehicle? Yes. And when you observed the police, the Kauai Police Department search it, um, were Chad and Lori in the vehicle at the time it was searched? No, not at the time it was searched. Well, let me, let me rephrase that. Uh, had you seen them in it directly before it was searched? Yes. Okay. Um, did you have an opportunity to observe the items that were taken from that vehicle? Some of them. Some of them? Uh, from what you observed, did you observe anything that would indicate that J.J. Vallow and Tyler Ryan had been in that vehicle? No, I did not. Okay. Uh, did you help or did you observe any other search warrants being uh, served? <coughs> Yes, on their residence on Queen Emma Drive in Princeville. Okay. Um, did you enter that residence? I did. Uh, did you walk through the whole residence? Not the entire residence. Okay. Uh, what portion of that residence did you walk through? The downstairs bedroom area and uh, the upstairs living room. Okay. Uh, in any of the areas you observed, did you observe anything that would indicate, such as, well, did you observe anything that would indicate that J.J. Vallow had been there? No. Did you observe anything that would indicate that Tyler Ryan had been there? No. Okay. Uh, detective, after, after you returned from Kauai, did you ever have a reason to go back to Kauai? I did. And what was that? to also assist the Kauai Police Department with the arrest warrant of Lori Vallow. Okay. Do you know what she was arrested for? A minor or desertion of her minor children, two counts and three misdemeanors. Okay. Judge, can I also have some foundation, date, time, place? Yes. 
uh, when approximately did you uh, return to Kauai? Uh, middle of February. Okay. Uh, do you recall what day you returned from Kauai? Uh, a couple days after she was arrested, which was February 20th, so a couple days after that. Okay. Did you ever have an opportunity to be in court with the defendant Vallow? Yes. Uh, did you observe if she was notified of her charges? She was. Were you able to observe if the defendant Chad Daybell was present in the courtroom? Yes, he was. Okay. Detective, as part of your investigation, did you help execute a search warrant on Chad Daybell's residence? Judge, could I have some foundation again? I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but if we could have a date, time, place, and, and, and I can get some of this in cross in terms of uh, his representations, the last one about the middle of February, I would think that he'd have a more specific time in mind, but uh, if we could have some specifics, I would appreciate it in terms of the date and time. Are you talking about the courtroom issue or the, uh, the warrant issue? I'm talking about the warrant issue. All right. Uh, Mr. Wood, it sounds like you just you, you, you asked the question if, uh, if a warrant was done. I'll let Mr. Hermosillo answer that question. Then as far as the, the foundational issue, I'll sustain that objection. Mr. Wood, you'll need to lay some foundation. Okay. Uh, detective, as part of your investigation, uh, on June 9th of 2020, uh, did anything significant happen that day? Yes. Okay. Uh, where did that happen? In Fremont County at Mr. Daybell's residence. Do you know the address? 202 North 1900 East. Have you observed Mr. Daybell at that residence? Yes. Okay. Uh, what was your purpose of being at that residence? To serve a search warrant of the property. Okay. Uh, and did you, I believe you already said this, but just, in, just for clarity of the record, what county is that residence located at? Fremont County. Okay. Uh, Detective, what was the first thing you did in serving that warrant on June 9th? We walked up to the front door to make contact with Mr. Daybell. Um, and what did you do after that? We were able to make contact with Mr. Daybell's son who answered the front door. Uh, he and another son led us into Mr. Daybell's room where he was told that we had a search warrant for the property. Okay, and then what happened? Mr. Daybell came out of the room. Uh, he was able to sit in the kitchen area. Uh, he was allowed to speak with his attorney uh, inside the kitchen area. Okay. Uh, what happened after that? Mr. Daybell was told if he wanted to stay on the property, which he could have, he would have to be accompanied by an officer for officer safety reasons. Uh, he was also told he was free to leave the residence if he wanted to. Okay. And then what happened? Uh, Mr. Daybell left and went and sat in his vehicle, um, which was parked in the driveway facing west off of 1900 East. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, the state does have a demonstrative exhibit. We'd like to show the, defend, uh, the, uh, the witness for purposes of clarity for the court and to uh, uh, further help the court understand what the detective is describing. All right. Can you show that demonstrative exhibit to Mr. Pryor, please? Your Honor, may I uh, set up the easel and place You may. Mr. Pryor, an objection? No, Judge. Mr. Wood, have you marked this exhibit? We have not yet, Your Honor. Your Honor, does the court have a preference on how a demonstrative exhibit is marked? No. Uh, why don't we just mark it as the next number that you've got there. I, I believe the last exhibit that was marked was marked as Exhibit 9. This would be Exhibit 10. Uh, Your Honor, I will mark that as such. You 
be marked as Exhibit 10. Mr. Pryor, just so I'm clear, any objection to the publishing and or the admission of Exhibit 10 for demonstrative purposes? I'm sorry, Judge. Just so I'm clear, Mr. Pryor, any objection to the publication and or the uh, admission of Exhibit 10 for demonstrative purposes? No, Judge, but what I would like to do is leave that up because I'm probably going to use that on cross of this officer. So if, if uh, my preference is, is that if uh, when Mr. Wood is done, that that remain up so that I can uh, use it in, again as part of my cross-examination, if I may, Judge. That's fine. We'll probably move it to the side uh, okay. if there's something that happens after this between you and, and cross-examination, but we'll make sure that it's available to you at cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Wood, you may inquire. Um, uh, before I do, uh, Mr. Pryor, can you... That. I can. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Okay. And can the court and I it? can. Okay, Detective Herma CEO, do you recognize that that exhibit, State's Exhibit 10? Yes, I do. Uh, what is it? It's an aerial photograph of Mr. Daybell's property. Okay. Again, what what county is that in? Fremont County. Now, uh, do you recall Mr. Daybell's address? 202 North, 1900 East. Okay. Uh, Detective, you were, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you were talking about what happened that morning. You'd served the warrant on Mr. Daybell. Um, and then I believe you stated that he had gotten in his vehicle. Is that accurate? That's correct. Uh, and can you, Your Honor, I'm not quite sure how we're going to do this with the COVID restrictions and plexiglass. Um, so I guess we'll just take it as it goes. If you're going to ask him to, to leave the witness, we'll call it the cubicle, uh, I will ask Mr. Uh, or Detective Hermosillo to put his mask on when he goes out there to point at the... There's a laser light over there too, Mr. Wood, if you'd like him to use that. That would be, that would be perfect. Okay. Can you make sure, uh, Detective, that that laser light works? Yep. Okay. And is, can the court and defense see that? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Okay. Okay. Uh, Detective Hermosillo, can you point to where you observed Mr. Daybell in his vehicle, like you were describing? Mr. Daybell was in this vehicle here, facing westbound. This is 1900 East. Okay. Um, where were you standing? I was standing right here, and then I was at Mr. Daybell's driver's door speaking with him um, just briefly, asking him if he needed a coat or anything out of the house. Okay. And were you able to clearly view Mr. Daybell? Yes. Okay. Uh, what did you observe when you were watching Mr. Daybell? Mr. Daybell was on the phone uh, sitting in the driver's seat. He had the phone in his right hand and was intently continuing looking over his right shoulder. Um, he would look over his right shoulder for a while, break contact, talk on the phone for a second, and then he would look, continue looking back over his right shoulder, okay. pretty intently over his right shoulder. Did you have an opportunity to stand in, in roughly that same location that he had been in that day? Yes. Okay. Uh, for purposes of your investigation, uh, did you attempt to orient yourself towards in the same manner that you viewed Mr. Daybell orient himself? Yes. Okay. When you did that, uh, what did you see? Well, the, the second time Mr. Daybell had got out of the vehicle and went to the back of his vehicle, uh, he was wearing a hat. Um, he stood at the back of his vehicle looking in the same direction he was looking when he was inside the driver's seat. Uh, he took off his hat, ran his fingers through his hair, looked down towards the ground, put his hat back on, went back inside uh, the driver's seat of that vehicle. Okay. Now, a detective, I, 
I don't think you quite understood my question. I, I apologize. Must not have been very clear. Um, when you did you ever stand in that same location that day? I did. I was talking with Mr. Daybell while he was outside of his vehicle. Okay. And did you ever orient yourself in the same lo uh, direction that you viewed Mr. Daybell orient himself? Yes. And when you oriented yourself in that same direction, uh, what did you find yourself looking at? The north side the north side of the property at the pond area. Okay, now when you say the pond area, can you identify that? This this here is the pond area. Okay. And there's a there's a tree just to the north just on the outer side of the pond. Okay. Now, detective, you you testified earlier you were there to serve a search warrant, correct? Yes. Um did uh, who were Rexburg police officers involved in serving that warrant? Yes, Rexburg was involved. Were there other law enforcement agencies involved in, in executing that warrant? Yes, there was. Okay. Um, what other agencies were involved? Fremont County Sheriff's Department and the FBI ERT team. All right. Do you know what ERT stands for? Evidence response team or recovery team. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, detective, I'm going to call your attention to that pond area that you were, uh, that you just previously pointed at. Um, did you observe the ERT team uh, engage in any activity on that spot that day? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, what did you first observe? I first observed uh, the ERT team marking off different areas and grading different areas in the backyard of Mr. Daybell's property. Okay. Judge, could I have some time and, and foundation in terms of approximately what time did he observe that taking place? I'll lay yes. that foundation, Your Honor. Thank you. Approximately what time did you, did you see that happen? Roughly around 9 in the morning. Okay. Uh, what time, and, and to further lay that foundation, what time did you arrive at Mr. Daybell's property approximately that day? Approximately 7 a.m. Okay. Uh, so you just testified that around 9 you saw them grooting off certain areas. What did you observe after that? Uh, I observed the evidence response recovery team uh, and also cadaver dogs uh, working the entire backyard. So they worked the, the pond area and then they had marked off other areas inside the backyard. Okay. Um, And again, at that pond area, what did you observe after you saw the cadaver dogs and the gritting? Uh, they had found uh, an area of interest and had started focusing on the area right underneath the tree. Okay. And did you, did you go over to that area yourself? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, were you able to identify yourself the area of interest they were looking at? Yes. Uh, was there anything that stood out to you uh, in that area? Yes. What was that? There, there appeared to be, and, and this is just a guess, but a, about a four by two area of sod, what I can best describe as sod, in, in a shorter grass, in an area of longer weed growth, so that four by two area stuck out based on the 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 greenery around it. Okay. And then, what did you observe the ERT team do there? They began uh, pulling up the sod and topsoil. And then, what did they do? They continued to methodically remove dirt. And Judge, uh, can I inquire in in, in uh, aid of objection? You may. Judge, um, can I inquire as to whether the officer was specifically present at the time that these actions were taking place, or was, did he return back to Mr. Daybell's vehicle? You may, you may ask the question. Detective Hermosillo, I'm going to direct you to answer that question. Yes, I was there. You were there at the, the pond in the tree? That is correct. Okay. Thank you, Judge. Mr. Wood, you may proceed. Thank you. 
Um, I, I believe you just testified they started removing, uh, I, think, I think you called it sod, is that accurate? Yes. Um, what did you observe them do as they, what did you observe as they removed that sod? They removed some topsoil that was right underneath the sod, uh, which revealed three large white rocks, flat rocks. Okay, and can you explain for the court how those rocks were oriented? Uh, in a row, so there was a large rock, a large rock, and a large rock. Okay, uh, after you observed that, what did you observe next? They removed the rocks and it, underneath the white rocks was some thin wood paneling. Okay, and uh, what did you observe them do with that paneling? They removed the paneling. Okay, and then what did you observe? Uh, initially, as soon as they re removed the paneling, I could smell the odor of a decomposing body. Okay, detective. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions on that. Uh, through your training and experience, uh, have you had multiple occasions to be around uh, deceased bodies? Yes. Uh, what are some circumstances in which uh, you would, in the course of your duties, be around that? In the last 19 years, I've been on plenty of suicides that had been left in apartments with, that were decomposing various states also unattended deaths of uh, various ages of people. Um, so during the 19 years, I've, I've been to a lot of those. Okay, and, and is it your testimony that, uh, to your perception, that uh, state of uh, a body, a, a deceased body in, in some sense of decomposition has a specific smell that you recognize? Yes. Okay, and, did, and it is your testimony that you recognize that smell uh, at that location? That's correct. Okay. Um, after you noticed that smell, what did you observe? I observed the ERT team methodically move away more soil from that area. All right. Um, and then what happened? Uh, they removed some soil and, and there was a, once they removed some soil, there was a, a black what I can best describe as a black plastic bag with a, a round object protruding through the dirt. Okay. Uh, what did you observe the ER team do after you saw that? They dug a little bit more around the round, round object, which appeared to me to be the crown of a head uh, protruding through the dirt. They used a small, sharp instrument to cut through the black plastic. Okay. And what did you observe when they did that? There was a white plastic underneath the black plastic, and they also used the white instrument to cut through the white plastic. Okay. And what did you observe when they did that? I observed what looked to be brown human hair. Okay. Um, once that was discovered, uh, what did the ER? What did you observe the ER team to? Excuse me. What did you observe the ERT? team do? They continued to just work around the head that was exposed. Uh, they took pictures, they did whatever their team leader instructed them to do. Okay. Uh, was an item of interest eventually pulled out of that area? Yes. And can you describe what that item of interest looked like? It was a what appeared to be a small body tightly wrapped in black plastic uh, covered in duct tape. Okay. Uh, after that item was recovered, um, what did you observe happen with that item? That item was then placed into the back of the coroner's vehicle. Okay. Um, and did you have an opportunity to uh, observe what the coroner did with it? Yes. About what time of day was this? Uh, roughly uh, 11. 
Okay. In the morning. Uh, what did you observe the coroner do with that that item of interest? The coroner brought the uh, bag up to Madison Memorial, where it was placed in the morgue. Okay. And did you? So, were you in the vehicle with the uh, the county coroner, or did you observe that from another vehicle? I was not in the vehicle. I was following directly behind the okay. coroner's vehicle. Uh, did you ever lose sight of that vehicle? No, I did not. Okay. And did you watch that item of interest be placed in the the hospital morgue? Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, Detective, uh, while you were observing uh, what happened at uh, the ERT site, at uh, that that site we've just discussed, north of the pond. Um, did you ever leave that site for any purpose? Yes, I did. Uh, what did you do? Well, be, uh, about what time did you leave that site? Before noon. Okay. And what did you do? I assisted uh, Sergeant Eric Wheeler in placing Mr. Daybell into custody off of a traffic stop. Okay. Um, Detective, after you uh, observed the county coroner take that on my item of interest up to the Madison Memorial Hospital, uh, did you return to the Daybell property? Yes, I did. What did you do there? I assisted the other ERT members uh, in excavating different areas on Mr. Daybell's property. Okay. Uh, can you show the court the areas you assisted in excavation? And Judge, so that we have a clear record, could you also vocalize that as well, please? That's fine. Mr. Hermesy, I'm going to direct you to uh, shine your laser pointer at that and also verbalize what you're describing, what you're pointing at. I'm describing, or I'm pointing to a fire pit on Mr. Daybell's property just north east correction northwest of the fire pit there is what we've referred to the pet cemetery and it's just north of the pet cemetery where i helped excavate okay um and that area that you just referred to as a pet cemetery uh, why did you call it a pet cemetery uh, there was pets buried there okay uh, were you able to identify uh, uh, you said there are pets so when you say pets are you referring to non-human animals that's correct okay and, and judge could i inquire again in terms of aid of objection you may okay officer you had mentioned that there were pets buried there can you give me the source of the information that advised you that there were pets buried there i assisted in digging them up there was a dog and a cat did you dig up the entire pet cemetery? I personally did not dig up the entire pet cemetery. Did anybody pit. dig up the entire pet cemetery? Uh, I can't answer that. Were you there? Your then? Honor, I'm going to object. This this line of questioning doesn't go towards any objection. Well, he, he, he acknowledged that he had uh, um, uh, assisted in digging up a dog, at least a dog and a cat. He had mentioned pets. I think it. You ought to be able to inquire as to whether or not he went through the entire pet cemetery or not. I'm going to overrule the objection, Mr. or Detective Hermosillo. You can answer the question. Did you dig up the whole pet cemetery? I personally did not. We were instructed to do different tasks. So uh, when we started on one task, we would complete it and then we would move to something else. But there were several ERT members that were on scene that may have done that that may have done that or did you observe anybody dig up the entire pet cemetery again your honor this goes to a factual issue not a legal objection mr prior it appears that you're doing a cross-examination here which objection are you trying to lay foundation for judge i'll i'll get the information through cross-examination let's move on That's thank you why don't we take a brief recess it is uh almost 10 30. we'll take a 15 minute recess and then we'll go back on the record okay. mm -hmm. We'll go back on the record here in CR 2220-755, State of Idaho versus Chad Daybell.
Court took a brief recess. It's now a quarter to 11. The witness, Detective Hermosillo, is still on the witness stand, still under oath. We're still continuing with direct examination. Mr. Wood, you may continue to inquire. Thank you. Uh, Detective Hermosillo, uh, we were discussing your observations of the ERT team in an area that you've identified as a pet cemetery, correct? That's correct. Uh, for purposes of clarity of the record, I'm going to kind of skip back to a couple of things. Uh, you've described Mr. Daybell's house as being in Fremont County, correct? Yes. And just for purposes of the record, that is Fremont County in the state of Idaho, correct? Correct. Uh, you described Lori Vallow's apartment complex as being in Madison County? Correct. And, and again, for purposes, purposes of clarity of the record, that's Madison County in the state of Idaho. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right, let's get back to uh, where we were. Um, you have testified that you observed the ERT team, and I, I guess that's redundant. I should just say ERT, the T stands for team. Um, you observed ERT uh, uncover the remains of, of what you believe to be a dog and a cat. Correct. Um, what did you further, do you recall approximately what time of day that was? And yeah, what, what time of day was that? Uh, it was early afternoon, I, I'd guess one. Okay. Uh, while you were in that area, did you have a chance to further observe ERT um, excavate that area you referred to as the pet cemetery? Yes. Okay. Uh, what did you observe? I had uh, been away from that area, uh, but when I returned to that area, they had already dug down and located uh, a what would appear to be a, a mass of burnt flesh and charred bone. Okay. Um, do you recall approximately how deep down that was? I don't recall how, how deep it was. Okay. Um, did you observe them, did you observe ERT take that mass out of the ground? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, this search that commenced on June 9th, did it finish on June 9th? No. I did it. Con did it continue on to June 10th? Yes. Okay. Um, when, when the search uh, ended on June 9th, was, was the residence of uh, Chad Daybell secured? Yes, it was. And do you recall, did you observe if uh, uh, security guards were placed there? Yes. Okay. Um, let's talk about June 10th. Uh, did you observe that location? Let, let's go back to that pet cemetery location again. Did you observe any excavation being done on June 10th? Yes, I did. What did you observe? ERT uh, had gone back to the same spot where there was the mass of, of burnt flesh and, and bone and began excavating around that the best they could. Okay. Uh, and uh, what happened? They were ultimately able to to dig completely around uh, the entire mass uh, to reveal what they were digging up. Okay. Um, and did they remove uh, again that mass from that area? Yes, they did. Did you see what they did with it? Yes. What did they do with it? They put it in a bag and placed it in the back of the coroner's vehicle. Okay. Were there any other identifying features of that uh, in that area or as part of that mass that drew your attention? Yes, there was. What was it? There was a melted green bucket that it appeared that the 
the burnt flesh had been placed in uh, under the bucket was a partial human skull. Uh, and were, uh, was that bucket and the, uh, the, what you've just described as a partial human skull, were those also, did you observe what was done with those? Yes. What was done with those? They were also placed into a bag and placed in the coroner's vehicle. Okay. And do you remember approximately what time those items were placed in the coroner's vehicle? Approximately? Uh, afternoon, maybe three or four-ish. Okay. Uh, for the purposes of your investigation, um, uh, did you, uh, what else did you do on June 10th? I followed the Fremont County Coroner, uh, Fremont County Detective Vince Kaikamanu and Ron Ball. We went to Boise to the Ada County Coroner's Office with the remains that were recovered that day. Okay. Uh, did you, before you left to go to Boise, did you uh, have an opportunity to go to the Madison Memorial Hospital? In yes. Rexford? Yes. And what did you do there? Recovered uh, the remains found from the first day as well. Okay. And you observed uh, what you recognize as those same remains? That's correct. Okay. Detective, I'm going to call your attention to June 11th. Uh, what did you do in furtherance of your investigation that day? We were at the Ada County Coroner's office. Okay, and let me stop you real quick. About what time did you get there? We arrived there on June 10th. Okay. Uh, that day on June 11th, we got there in the morning. Uh, and look, I have, let's go back to June 10th really quick. Uh, when you arrived in Boise, uh, what was the first thing you did there? We went to the Ada County Coroner's office. Okay. Uh, do you remember approximately what time you got there? Um, evening. Okay. All right. And now back to June 11th. Uh, approximately what time did you return to the coroner's office? Uh, early morning. Okay. Um, Detective, uh, once you once you arrived on June 11th, uh, what was the what did you do uh, in furtherance of your investigation? Observe the autopsies of those remains that were recovered. Okay. Uh, well, now you, we've you've discussed uh, two separate. Um, I'll at this point call them items of interest. Uh, did you recognize those items of interest again in the coroner's office? Yes, I did. Okay. And do you know if those items had been secured there the night before? They had been. Okay. What was the, once you arrived in the autopsy room, what was the first thing you observed? The first thing I observed was the black bag that was covered in duct tape that had had been removed from the area underneath the tree by the pond was placed on the table. Okay, and you recognize that as the same black bag? Yes. Um, how did you recognize that? The duct tape and the black plastic that had still had dirt all over it. Okay. Uh, what did you observe? Uh, who was with you? The medical examiner was in the room, uh, Lieutenant Ron Ball, Detective Vince Kai Kamanu, and the Fremont County Coroner, uh, Brenda Dye. Okay. Um, was there a, a medical examiner there? Yes. Do you know who he was? Garth Warren. Okay. I'm sorry, Judge. I, 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 Garth, Garth Warren. Um, and did, you've testified, you, you observed those proceedings? Yes. Correct. Um, once that bag was, as you testified, moved to the table, what did you observe was done with it? The ME um, 
grabbed a small sharp instrument and cut down the middle of the black plastic. Okay. Uh, and what did you observe? I observed a small child uh, in red pajamas, red pajama shirt, red pajama pants, black socks that had the word Skechers in orange across the toes. I also observed a light and blue blanket that had been placed on top of him. Okay. Uh, Detective, were there, um, when you observed what you perceived to be a child, were there, was there anything that drew your attention? Yes. Uh, can you uh, describe one of, uh, can you describe for the court what drew your attention? The amount of duct tape that was covering the body. Okay. Uh, where was that duct tape located? On the head arms and feet. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the head area. Uh, um, when, when you looked at the head, uh, what, did you, what did you observe there? The head had a white plastic bag over the top of it. It appeared to be a normal trash bag, had a red drawstring. Uh, it appeared to be the expandable type of trash bag with the waffle style pattern on top of the head. Okay. Uh, and you had mentioned duct tape there. How, where did you observe the duct tape? There was duct tape that were, was tightly wrapped around this way, tightly from his chin to his forehead area. Uh, several layers of duct tape tightly wrapped. Okay. Uh, what did you observe the medical examiner and his team do with, with that material? They ended up uh, using a small, sharp instrument and cut down the middle of it to expose what was underneath. Okay, and, and when they exposed underneath, what did you observe? An additional piece of duct tape that was stretched from jawline to jawline across the mouth. Okay, and when you say across the mouth, at this point, were you looking at this child's face? I was. Okay. Um, As you uh, looked at this child's face, did you recognize this child? Yes, I did. Uh, how did you recognize this child? From the hundreds of photographs and, and video I've seen over the last eight months, I recognize that to be the same little boy that was laying on the table. Okay, and, and can you, uh, who was that little boy? Joshua Vallow. Uh, were there any uh, features that, that helped you recognize him? Yes. What were they? He had the same style haircut that he had in the videos that I had seen and the photographs I had seen just prior to my welfare check with him in September, the last photograph I had seen uh, on September 22nd. And that was shaved on the sides and longer on top. Okay. Thank you. Um, were there any other items of, uh, were, were there any other uh, items of interest to you on that body? Yes. Uh, can you describe, uh, what were they? His hands were folded about chest high. Um, Detective, can you lift that a little bit higher so that people can see? Folded like this, chest high. He had duct tape continuously wrapped from elbow all the way around his arms, over his hands, all the way to his right elbow. Uh, several layers of duct tape that were tightly wrapped. Um, and the way, best way I can describe it is he had a ball of duct tape over where his hands would be. Okay. Uh, was that duct tape removed? Yes, it was. And what did you observe after that? His wrists were also bound with another layer of duct tape. Okay. Uh, after that, was there anything else that caught your attention about the way uh, this child was found? Uh, yes, I, I noticed 
that his ankles were also bound uh, with duct tape as well. Okay. Uh, after you, you observed that, did you observe uh, the autopsy of that child? I did. Okay. Um, detective, upon the conclusion of that autopsy, uh, did you witness another examination that day? Yes, I did. Do you remember approximately when that examination started? Uh, in the afternoon. Okay. Uh, what did you observe in that second examination? I observed the same melted green bucket with the charred flesh and charred bone uh, that was located on Mr. Daybell's property that was now sitting on the table in the medical examiner's office. Okay, thank you. Um, Your Honor, the state has no further questions at this time. Thank you. Cross-examination, Mr. Pryor. Thank you, Your Honor. 